to another one of my Dr. Sam Chalk and Talk videos, and in this one I am actually addressing a question which I decided, uh, instead of actually being put to me, I decided to appropriate from one of my colleagues. Um, the context is this, we were having this uh, Facebook discussion in which he was talking about his medieval political theory class, and of course the Bin Laden um, news that came up brought up uh, the issue of you know, fundamentalism and um, he had said that his class actually uh, in some ways had to do with, with fundamentalism and I said well it, it doesn't make that much sense to say that about, about medievals um, and here's the question that, that oriented his class his medieval political theory class are fundamentalists Medieval or anti-modern? And I put the anti in parentheses there because to be anti-modern in certain ways means actually being preeminently modern as well. And part of the goal of this class was to you know, lead his, his uh, students through um, some Christian philosophers and some, some Muslim philosophers, uh, notably Augustine and uh, Aquinas, and to show them that medieval philosophy and medieval attitudes towards religion and the, the confluence of faith and reason is something very different from contemporary forms of what he was calling fundamentalism. And then I, I you know, being the religious studies scholar, took him to task for using fundamentalism in a very loose and what I consider sloppy and in some ways irresponsible way. And he said, yes, the religious studies people always get on me about this, but I think it has a certain utility. And I do grant that there is a certain utility in, in using the term. I, I don't think that these are actually compatible. Here's what I want to actually um, talk about tonight, then. Two different topics. One, what does it actually mean to be a fundamentalist? What does that mean in a rigorous sense? What does that mean in a broader sense? When does one legitimately use a term, and when does one uh, reinforce stereotypes uh, by, by using that term? And then I want to talk about the issue of time, temporality, through history, and how different ages and different groups within those different ages understand the flow of time, the passage of time, and development. Um, then I'm going to actually have a suggestion about how best to understand the notion of fundamentalism and some of the other groups that we call fundamentalists in our time, and we're using it in a very uh, non-rigorous, loose sense of the term. So, let's talk about fundamentalism to begin with. Now, this is something I would stress to my students in religious studies classes from the very beginning. As soon as somebody used that word, I would say, what do you mean by that word fundamentalist? And it usually turned out they didn't actually mean, unless they were a fundamentalist themselves, what the precise signification of the term is. Instead, what they meant was something more like this, this very loose sense. And yes, I, I am in fact oversimplifying here. This is not a a uh, false dilemma because I'm not claiming that these are the only ways of using the term, but these are these are two very prevalent ways in which, which the term is used. Usually they were using it in a very loose or careless sense where they mean anybody who um, has you know, fairly strongly held traditional conservative views on, on religious matters and they're coming from a particular faith tradition, which usually they know fairly well. They tend to be literalists about uh, whatever religious text that they're, they're using, and they tend to be um, fairly aggressive, fairly, um, how to put it, fairly in your face, um, fairly confrontational uh, and condemnatory. Um, does everyone who, who gets called a fundamentalist meet this bill? Definitely not. And as a matter of fact, it's used as a slur word. This is part of why I'm against using it in a loose sense. Because unfortunately, it gets used all too carelessly to, uh, in a pejorative way, to tar groups, to, to dismiss opponents, 
instead of actually taking them seriously and, and, and tackling them intellectually. By the way, I am not a fundamentalist. I don't fit into the fundamentalist spectrum whether you uh, want to talk in the straight sense or even in, in many understandings of the loose sense. But I think that you also shouldn't call people fundamentalists when they're not, especially if your goal is to dismiss them or to try to get other people to not take them seriously. Um, it's a convenient handle that gets used a lot. But before we talk about that, let's look at the, the strict sense. Who are the actual fundamentalists? It's a 20th century movement within Protestant Christianity, within what we could call low church Protestant Christianity. And it has to do with, with issues of um, biblical criticism and the inerrancy of the Bible. Um, and as a matter of fact, there were these books, um, while well, they were actually pamphlets originally, but you can get them in a nice two-volume version, The Fundamentals. This is the, the stuff that made fundamentalists what they are. These are the actual fundamentals. Why do they call them the fundamentals? Well, their view was there were certain traditional bits of Christian doctrine that were absolutely fundamental to the Christian message to the Christian way of life, to salvation, and if you compromised on those, you might be able to compromise on some things, but if you compromise on those, the whole thing is over. It's no longer Christianity. So they are dealing with a particular notion of the essence of Christianity. They're also coming out of a you know, late Protestant Reformational type of, of thought. Um, so you know, a genuine fundamentalist is, is, you know, would blanch at the notion of when I'm speaking of a Catholic fundamentalist, or Mormon fundamentalist sects, or Islamic fundamentalists, they would say, hey, those aren't even Christians. I mean, they, hardcore fundamentalists don't consider Catholics to be Christians. And they would say, um, you know, fundamentalist refers to those who actually subscribe to the fundamentals and go one step further. This is how fundamentalists are different from evangelicals, another major group within the American religious landscape and also within the world uh, Christian uh, religious landscape as well. How do they differ from evangelicals? Well, evangelicals think that if you're dealing with people who have a mistaken understanding of things, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to even, you're supposed to preach the evangelion, the gospel, the uh, evangel, you know, that's the French uh, cognate for it. You're supposed to evangelize. Fundamentalists are basically separatists. They say, look, that doesn't work. You have to actually separate yourself off from those people who may claim to be believers but aren't really believers. That's what's what, you know, that's one of the big divides between the actual fundamentalists and evangelicals who get called fundamentalists all the time. Um, and, you know, generally get called fundamentalists by people who are either ignorant of what the term really means and the history of it and, you know, the groups that, that it belongs to, or they're doing it deliberately to try to discredit evangelicals by tying them in with the, the in some ways, more radical uh, and more conservative fundamentalists. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a loose or careless sense of the term. If we just look within the Christian spectrum, you see that there are quite a few people who, who um, will call any conservative Christian of any group um, a fundamentalist, even when it doesn't really make much sense. You know, to talk of Catholic fundamentalists, you're really stretching the term. And it's difficult to figure out what exactly you mean. It's better to actually use some of the, the jargon that's out there, like, uh, you know, the, the word traditionalist got kind of hijacked, or ultramontanists, or things like that. To be, you know, specific. Uh, if you talk about uh, Mormon fundamentalist sects out in the desert that are still practicing polygamy and occasionally getting gun battles with each other, um, again, you're, you're really stretching the term. Same thing if you're applying it to, to uh, Muslims. I mean, in one sense, any Orthodox Muslim is going to be a fundamentalist because they believe that the, the Quran and the Hadith are inspired, you know, and that you you have to, any, any real Islamic life is going to have to be oriented by them. Well, that makes almost everybody a fundamentalist. So that 
means that it's a sloppy use of language that's not very, very helpful if we want to actually distinguish things. People speak of uh, Hindu fundamentalism as well, I think, or Jewish fundamentalism. And I think that this is not a very helpful way of, of looking at things. Um, where does that come from? Well, here's where I'm actually going to use some chalk. Let's think about the, the, the old timeline, you know, going from antiquity all the way through modernity. Uh, we should probably put the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution and all of those things in there as well. Um, in the ancient world, did they have the conception, as often many people have had uh, of them, that things were just completely static or cyclical? Many people did. Did all the ancients believe that? No. As a matter of fact, if you read Aristotle, you will see Aristotle speaking about progress, talking about how things have changed over time, how perceptions, how we now understand more, and projecting a little bit uh, ahead as well. Very often the medievals are represented as, or the, the ancients are represented as if they had this static conception of the universe or cyclical conception and things just, you know, had to keep on going the same way. If you're an attentive reader of ancient philosophy, you'll find out that that's not always the case. And then there's this sort of notion that, well, how did history get introduced? It got introduced through, through Judaism and Christianity. That's a great oversimplification. Let's say that that's actually, actually true. Let, let's go with it. So Christianity comes in in late antiquity, Judaism kind of paves the way, and then we get thoroughly within the medieval period. How do these medievals think of themselves? I love these, these uh, medieval shows where they actually talk about themselves as being medieval or as being in the Dark Ages, because the Dark Ages, yes, people did actually think of that not as the Dark Ages, but as something tantamount to you know, the end of the world and the, the scourge of God coming upon them because civilization was crumbling because of these barbarians. But if you actually look at medieval history and you approach it with fresh eyes and you look at medieval texts, what do you find? You find a constant ferment of intellectual and physical and organizational work. You find progress taking place all over the place. Every monastery that went off to the wilderness, uh, not only to, to you know, uh, be alone so they could, so they, could, they could think about God, did not just you know, replicate old texts. They added to things. They founded schools. They cultivated the earth. Towns formed around them because they were instruments of progress. And if you actually look and you actually read medieval thinkers, you will find out that those dark ages quite often were not as dark as the later ages made them out to be. Nor did the medievals necessarily think of themselves as heading towards something or being in between something. They did look to the past because they thought that the people in the past were not a bunch of dummies and still had something to offer them. And yes, there was at times, you might say, a slavish devotion to the past. But was that often the case? Read some medieval texts and find out. Read Thomas Aquinas, read Augustine, read Anselm, and see just how slavish followers they are of Aristotle or Augustine or you know, Plato or pick whoever you want. You won't find that to be the case at all. As a matter of fact, here's one thing that I actually use in some of my classes. You may see this as a little bit of a digression. Um, St. Anselm. I, I asked my classes, in the Middle Ages, uh, was, did the people think the world was flat or round? Oh, they all thought it was flat. Really? Then why does St. Anselm say, well, you know, the world is this globe, as we all know. In the sense that, hey, we all know this, I'm going to begin from some starting point because it will make sense to you. And then they say, oh, really? That's, that's the case? Where did they get this weird notion that, that the medievals were all these sort of benighted people of faith who put their trust in blind dogma and uh, you know, didn't think about things? They got it from later on, didn't they? Um, some interesting things do take place. You know, the, the Renaissance, the Reformation, new contributions to the world of ideas. But you know, those who are 
are continuing on with this. They continue throughout modernity to rethink things. You can find Thomist philosophers today who are taking up all the great thoughts of these figures and trying to assimilate them. Alistair McIntyre is a great example. Um, Norris Clark, another great example. Now, from the perspective of the Reformation and the Renaissance, they were both trying to get back to a kind of antiquity, a moment. You know, what was the Reformation about? Let's get away from this church. Let's get away from these accretions. We need to get back to original Christianity. What was the Renaissance about? We need to get back to the original insights and the texts and the, the beautiful ideas and the ways of life that the, the, the Greeks and the Romans had. Yeah, you know, there's something to that. What goes on in modernity? Modernity, and especially the Enlightenment, understands itself as one of two ways. Either counterposed to all of this, which was bad, or as, you know, beginning with the seed of this, which goes back to this, and all of this in, in between here, the medieval period, this was all bad. This was dark ages, this was foolishness, this was uh, priestcraft, this was, you know, superstition. We could go on and on and on. What's interesting about modernity is that modernity unleashes forces that cannot actually be controlled within the, the what we, you know, one philosopher called the dialectic of enlightenment. And eventually it leads to all sorts of uh, crises, all sorts of collapses, all sorts of um, people who just don't believe in the modern promise the way that some of the early moderns represented it and the way that um, some of their, their contemporaries were, you know, going on in a very dogmatic fashion about that. Uh, and some terrible catastrophes took place, economic, political, military, um, you know, to, to do that. And now we find ourselves in a, in a time that uh, some people want to call post-modernity. I call it late modernity following, following Jameson because I don't see it as fundamentally detached from um, the modern thing. And I see much of postmodern stuff is just cycling around within the modern, or at best replicating some of the insights that the medievals actually expressed and expressed much more systematically and with more insight. Um, so if we want to ask ourselves, fundamentalists, let's say we're talking about fundamentalists in the strict sense, are they medievalists? No, because they're not returning to anything remotely medieval. Nothing like the synthesis of faith and reason and the sort of discourse and debate that went on first in the monasteries and in, in scholastic, in, in, um, sorry, in, in monastic theology and philosophy, and then even more in the schools in scholastic philosophy and theology before it became more of Contemporary fundamentalists, they're not doing anything remotely like that. As a matter of fact, where do you locate them? Thoroughly within modernity. Now here's where I actually have a suggestion, an idea. And I get this from um, fascist studies. There have been a lot of different theories about what constitutes fascism. There's no absolutely general agreement within the field. Uh, there have been a lot of, you might say, uh, half-baked or cockamamie theories. You know, the Marxist one that the fascists are just agents of the bourgeoisie, uh, clearly not, not you know, an inadequate conception of fascism. Uh, some people saw it as sort of a return to, um, you know, primi more primitive or, you know, pre-modern ways of being. I don't buy that. I think that the better theories out there are that fascism is not just anti-modern, not just archaic, uh, national socialism to an integral nationalism, that's why I have those abbreviations. I buy the idea that they have a different vision of modernity. So what goes on when fascism comes on the scene is very similar to what's going on when, when uh, Marxism and communism comes on the scene. Uh, we are being presented with a fundamentally different version of what modernity should look like and should be doing from within modernity itself. It may take some pre modern elements to it, but everything has some pre-modern elements actually, if you look at it carefully. 
Um, I think that this also, here's where, you know, I, I have some suggestions that I think people um, could, could reject. Or might say, yes, that makes some sense. I think that fundamentalists in the strict sense, where we're talking about this, I think that they fit that same dynamic. They are, you might say, a kind of anti-modernism only by virtue of being modern, being so thoroughly modern that they can reject it from the inside out, and they can reject what they see as, as you know, detritus, as non-essential to them. The uh, liberal or the, you know, in, in our political spectrum, conservative way of having what we call liberal democracy, um, which is not, in fact, the, you know, the, the form of political life that makes people the most enthusiastic. Um, I think that you can say the same thing about totalitarian Islam. And I want to be very careful to stress here, I do not think that uh, all Muslims are totalitarian in their conception of things. I do think that some of what we call Islamic fundamentalists or radical Islams are better described as totalitarian uh, Islam. Not, you know, Islamofascism or anything like that. I think that it's a different type of totalitarianism, in some ways more difficult and to, to deal with and with greater staying power. And of course its own history going back uh, all the way to, to an intellectual crisis after uh, the Mongols came in and, and smashed some of the Muslim uh, Powers. I think it has a much greater ideological base than, than fascism did, um, or even you know, contemporary Christian fundamentalism, uh, which is fairly non-political actually. Um, but I think that all three of these, and, and these two things, Christian fundamentalism, fundamentalism in the strict sense, totalitarian Islam, are both things that get called by the term fascism, or not fascism, uh, fundamentalism. Actually, some people do call it just fascism, too. So, I think that um, perhaps what we should understand all of this is, is something going on here. Something going on purely here, and haven't lost any sort of real contact with the medieval uh, views on things. I'm less convinced about, about Islam when it comes to that. Um, I do think that a lot of the, the Muslim conceptions of Muslim uh, Middle Ages are, are rather hazy and ideological. Um, you know, uh, a lot of the things that, that, that went on are things that, that Islamic, uh, totalitarian Muslims do in fact reject. But that's, that's a subject of a different thing. So, are fundamentalists medieval or anti-modern? I think the answer is, is clearly that they are anti-modern.